Well, the first thing I would like to do is thank you all for coming. This has been a terrific treat for me to see people I haven't seen for many years and to meet some new people I haven't known that well. And uh, so I really do appreciate your coming. And I also want to thank uh, Chris and Dave especially for putting on this field trip that we had yesterday. That was a fabulous trip. Some of the best outcrops I've seen anywhere. And I also, of course, want to recognize Sarah and Emily for <clears throat> work in the background. And finally, I'd like to thank my wife and Lisa for taking care of our homes uh, yesterday as we uh, made our way around on the field trip. The uh, first thing I'd like to do is find out how many of you can tell me what's on this obelisk. <laughs> How many? Uh, would you raise your hand if you know? Do oh, uh, there is a hand. There, there are two or three. Oh, you're 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 missing out on one of the principal important features in the history of the geology department at Washington and Lee. Uh, this uh, there there's a hall back here, part of the colonnade, that bears the name Robinson. Hall. And uh, this obelisk is uh, uh, a monument to John Robinson. Uh, he is the only person outside the Lee family, I think, who is buried on the campus. And he's buried under that. <laughs> <laughs> he was reinterred uh, after being buried somewhere else first. And my understanding is that they encased him in concrete, uh, just as they did Traveler. <laughs> there, there is a time capsule uh, encased in there with John Robinson and uh, so I want to start by telling you a little bit of the story of John Robinson he was born in Northern Ireland and he came to this well, see, that was 1745 he came to this country in 1770 uh, and his early existence over in Ireland was pretty dismal. It's, it's hard to find out many of the details, but he lost his father when he was a small kid. He was turned over to his uncle, who in turn turned him over, indentured him as a, a weaver. And so he went into this uh, family with the weaver, learned how to weave, but after he got to be the, the age of 17, he decided, enough of this uh, business over here in Ireland, I'm going to go to the United States. <clears throat> One of the really intriguing things is how he got here. How did he get the money to get across the ocean? And I don't know the answer to that, and I haven't been able to find it anywhere. But anyway, he did find his way across the ocean, and somehow or other he found his way to Rockbridge County, which was Augusta County at that time. He uh, uh, was he practiced being a weaver for a while, and uh, after a couple of years of that, he took up residence in a home uh, run by a fellow named General Bauer. Uh, General Bauer uh, owned a piece of property out on Thorn Hill. Have any of you ever ever been to Thorn Hill? That's a place you, you ought to, or one, one person in this room has been to, th oh, two, okay. Oh, they're going up, there's somebody back right there. Uh, Thorn Hill is one of the most beautiful homes uh, in Rockbridge County. And it belonged to uh, uh, the uh, general, uh, and let's see, where is this? <clears throat> have a little description of uh, that somewhere. Nope, looks like that page is missing. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I, I won't be able to, to speak it uh, eloquently as it was written, but uh, General Bauer uh, was uh, a member of one of the most important genteel families 
of Lexington back in the 1700s. He um, had bought this house. He uh, had a fortune, and how he developed that fortune, uh, I'm not quite sure. But uh, he uh, had a couple of daughters, and uh, he also had uh, a lot of horses and a carriage and uh, someone who uh, uh, drove the carriage. And one of the stories is that uh, one Sunday morning, uh, the two girls uh, arrived at the Presbyterian Church uh, in, in their very best party clothes. And uh, the Presbyterian Church was a pretty formidable uh, place at that time. Uh, these were very hardcore religious people, and, and they were shocked uh, to see this. What this tells me about uh, General Bauer is that that was a house that was filled with people who were pretty unconventional and uh, <clears throat> who uh, probably had a, a lot of fun in life. <laughs> well, the, uh, the, the important part of this is that somehow or other John Robinson was taken into this household. And uh, uh, in the household, uh, he was apparently uh, sort of a favorite son of sorts. Uh, uh, the general allowed him to uh, feed his horses and uh, provided uh, uh, whatever he needed for his sustenance. So um, uh, he hit on the idea of uh, going down to accumulate a little bit of money. He went down to the courthouse where they uh, traded horses and he bought a horse that was in bad shape, uh, took it back up to Thornhill and fed it and took care of it very, very carefully uh, for a month or two. And then he rode it back down to the courthouse and sold it. Well, when he sold it, he made a little extra money. And uh, so he bought another horse. Uh, and he uh, uh, proceeded to do the same thing. Took that horse back up to the general's house, fed him, took care of him, then brought him back down, sold him again. Uh, he established a, a pattern of doing this. Uh, and to the point that he became known as Jockey John Robinson. He had nothing to do with being a jockey, he never rode in a race, anything of that sort, <clears throat> but he was a very skilled uh, spotter of uh, good horse beat. So uh, he, uh, uh, I want to sh I have a picture here of uh, Thorn Hill. Uh, let's uh, tombstone. This is Thorn Hill. As it appears today, I just took this picture uh, uh, last week. It's a lovely place. Incidentally, it's on the market. If any of you have an extra <laughs> a million and a half dollars, <laughs> like to invest, uh, Thornhill could be yours. It's in a, in a beautiful place. Has beautiful barns behind it. Uh, lots of uh, lots of land with it. Uh, it's a place that uh, uh, you might enjoy retiring. Well. <clears throat> Robinson wound up making a lot of money. Uh, he accumulated some money uh, from the horse dealing, but uh, something else was going on at that time, and that was that during the Revolutionary War, the government had given out uh, coupons in place of money, since it wasn't really a, a currency, <clears throat> and uh, they, they promised to pay it all back. Well, of course, most people, after a year or two, began to think, well, they're never going to come across with this money. Uh, and so if we can get rid of these coupons some way, we're going to do it. And so a market was set up. And John Robinson saw the handwriting on the wall. He began to buy these things and paid one-tenth of their value. Well, after a few more years, he had collected quite a number of them. After a few more years, he uh, uh, had uh, a fortune in hand when the federal government decided they would actually pay the face value of the coupons. So suddenly, here's this guy, a weaver's indentured servant, uh, now with a fortune. And he uh, prevailed on uh, the general, who owned a lot of property around Rockridge County, to sell him a piece of property called Hart's Bottom. <clears throat> Anybody recognize where this is? No, it's uh, close to the iron ore. You will recognize the next one. 
This is downtown university. So Hart's Bottom, uh, which had belonged to, uh, I'm sorry, which had belonged to the general, uh, fell into the hands of Jockey John Robinson. And uh, he, was, he had a big farm there. Uh, he bought slaves. Uh, he was running a farming operation. He was not a very good farmer. And he uh, didn't handle his slaves very well. And uh, really was pretty much a failure over there, except for one thing. And that was that he learned how to distill whiskey. <laughs> and uh, so his, uh, his uh, goods in trade around the county was whiskey. Well, they, this was nothing illegal, or, and people respected him. He'd proven himself to be a very honest sort of guy. Uh, he uh, <clears throat> uh, had, had this fortune. I, I don't know if well, none of you were here in 1969, but all of this area <laughs> up to uh, halfway up the windows. Uh, was covered with water in uh, 1969 in uh, the flood uh, that accompanied uh, Camille. And it gave anyone who looked at it a, an idea of how extensive this place called Hart's Bottom was. Great, great farmland. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, Jockey John didn't know quite what to do with all of this money. And uh, in, uh, it was 1817, he was now in his 40s. In 1817, uh, the state was beginning to look for a place to put the University of Virginia. And uh, Jockey John uh, approached them and told them that he would leave his entire fortune, which amounted to about $65,000 in Revolutionary War age dollars. I don't know, is there someone here who can convert that into in terms of, you can imagine, this is a huge amount of money. Well, he was going to leave this uh, in his will to the state if they would select Washington College as the University of Virginia. And, uh, or if they would, if they didn't want to do that, if they would build it within four miles of Lexington. And apparently there was quite a, a battle going on here between the people in Stanton, uh, Augusta County, basically, and the people in Charlottesville. Well, they happened to have a resident over in Charlottesville named Jefferson. Uh, and uh, so you know the rest of the story. Uh, remember that uh, this would have been a fairly central location for the University of Virginia because West Virginia was all part of, of Virginia. And so it would have been centrally located had the university been placed here. But uh, Jefferson won that argument and uh, that's where the university wound up. I, I guess some of us can be thankful for that. Yes. Others may be <clears throat> not so thankful. Uh, during this period of time, uh, Washington Hall was being built, and uh, uh, at the setting of the cornerstone for Washington Hall, uh, Jockey John decided he would do something special. He was obviously a friend of a lot of people on the Board of Trustees, and so uh, he thought, I will throw a party uh, for the faculty and the administration. And I don't know, there were only a handful of students, so I don't know whether they were invited or not. But <clears throat> they had this party out on the front lawn. And uh, he provided 40 gallons of whiskey for this party. <laughs> well, unfortunately, they didn't have people monitoring who was coming to this. So news spread pretty fast in Lexington. <laughs> and uh, there were lots and lots of people out there. Uh, and of course, they were having their fill of whiskey. So after a while, the campus was just strewn with drunken bodies. <laughs> that, uh, that, un unfortunately, that is the thing that people remember about Jockey John Lott. Uh, you'll hear, hear this story over and over again uh, everywhere. And it was such a popular idea that when the law school uh, was uh, dedicated, uh, someone on the Board of Trustees arranged to have uh, a barrel of Scotch whiskey uh, sent over to accompany the celebration of the new building. Uh, and uh, I, I was invited to that. Is Uncas here anywhere? I was going to get him to fill us in on those 
details. He was a faculty member in the law school for most of his career. But uh, it, it was a great party. Uh, I haven't been able to find very many people who can remember much about the day. <laughs> I actually had a, a tin cup of my own. I, I lost that somewhere along the way. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that was the big event. People in uh, recalling Robinson always thought about this drunken brawl out on the, on the lawn, and they failed to think about what he had done in trying to get the University of Virginia here. And in fact, at that time, there were no gifts of that sort being made anywhere in the South. There may have been some going on in, in New England, but it was very, very unusual for someone to put up that kind of money, 65,000 uh, Revolutionary War dollars, uh, for an educational enterprise. Well, <clears throat> Robinson didn't have any children. Uh, so uh, when the time came to draw up a will, he did that. He had it drawn up two or three times. He didn't like the way it was worded the first time. But <clears throat> there is one section in it that uh, I think you'll be interested in. And it was, and I'm going to quote it, the money thus devised, which was money that would be derived from property he owns on Buffalo Creek and property he owned on the Calf Pasture River um, at that time, <clears throat> said, devised and received or a sufficient portion thereof shall be appropriated as soon as practical by the trustees of the college aforementioned uh, to the purchase of stock <clears throat> upon national security or other safe and lucrative stock that thereby a permanent fund may be provided upon which it is my will and desire to have erected a professorship of geology. He died in 1826. Uh, he actually added geology and agriculture <clears throat> and uh, of that said institution. Well, this is a remarkable thing. If you think about it, think about the history of geology. What was going on in 1826 when he died in the field of geology? Well, there was quite a, a, a debate going on in Scotland uh, between the Neptunists and the Plutonists, uh, Abraham Werner and, and uh, James Hutton. Uh, that argument was raging over there. The question that came to me was, how on earth did John Robinson know anything about that? You know, he was not educated in, in uh, Ireland. Uh, he had to have been educated by the general, General Brown. And so I think that's where the credit belongs. And uh, so uh, this remarkable thing that he did was uh, the beginning, I think, of emphasis on geology at this institution. There uh, <clears throat> wasn't long after, after that that um, the trustees decided they really needed to find out about breaking the will. Uh, there were <laughs> several, several things in here aside from the professorship in geology, uh, which probably most of the trustees didn't know much about anyway. And uh, uh, there was also a, a, a part of the will that said he did not want his property in the heart bottom to be sold. And he provided he wanted the slaves to be well taken care of. And so the, uh, the college uh, didn't have very, very much money, and they were looking for a way to <clears throat> take some of this money and use it for, for other things. And so we didn't get a, a professorship of geology. Uh, in his name until very much later. Uh, there was a legal opinion that was written up by, in a talk that was presented and called the Bear Hollow Lecture. <clears throat> and uh, basically the lawyer uh, gave this opinion. The dead should not try to manage the property of the living. <laughs> so <clears throat> think about that when you're writing your will. <laughs> now I have here is something I'd like to hand out. A 
I've got a couple of people who can do that. And I thought I, I would sort of recount <clears throat> some of the history of the teaching of geology uh, at what has become Washington and Lee University. Now this is a, a difficult thing to get information about. Uh, during the first uh, six years of the history of Washington College, uh, there were 13 people who received degrees. We have that many geology majors from it now. Uh, so for six years, there were that few people. Uh, there were four faculty members, four professors, four professors, uh, one of whom uh, was uh, in charge of a course called, or section of the curriculum called Natural Philosophy. And Natural Philosophy included some teaching of uh, geology. Well, one of the things you'll notice as you look down through here that there's sort of an incestuous relationship between uh, early members of the faculty. Uh, it turned out the first teacher uh, that we see in the catalog is a fellow named Edward Graham, uh, who happened to be the brother of the first president of um, the academy. And he, um, uh, Graham was a preacher, and I suspect that Edward was probably a preacher as well. Uh, there was a very, very close connection between the Presbyterian Church. Almost everybody here was a Presbyterian. Scot there were Scotch-Irish coming down the valley uh, out of Pennsylvania, and uh, they uh, settled in this area. Let's see if I... I'm not quite to this fellow yet. <clears throat> but um, the first real record that we have is in a catalog that's dated 1826, which happens to coincide with the same year that uh, Jack John Robinson died. <clears throat> uh, geology is not a, there's no department. That's the question people keep asking me. When did we have a geology department? Well, geology sort of evolved through the curriculum uh, long before it uh, became a department. But uh, in 1826, geology was mentioned as part of the curriculum, uh, taught under the guise of natural philosophy. Well, Graham was followed by a fellow named George Armstrong, who was the first person to carry the name Robinson. Uh, Robinson, professor of physical science. And that included lectures on geology, uh, the college was growing very rapidly, and catalogs contain very interesting information. And the university has a complete set of them back to 1826. And one of the assets of the university in 1826 was a collection of 3,000 samples of rocks and minerals. So geology was being recognized, uh, even though we didn't have a professorship of geology. <clears throat> a major change occurred when this fellow uh, came along, and uh, if you're looking at that sheet that I handed out, you can see the name Campbell appears repeatedly. Now, all of, all of those people, except for one or two, have connections, or had connections, with Washington and Lee. The most recent ones at the bottom are people that I actually met. Uh, they were receiving honorary degrees. And I, th I thought for some very, very important reasons. Uh, one of them had started public radio. And uh, the other one was very instrumental in convincing the federal courts to reject the idea of massive resistance to integration. So there is one bright spot in the history of uh, the university on that particular issue. Uh, despite uh, all the negative sides to it. Well, a Professor uh, Campbell, John Lyle Campbell, uh, was named the Robinson Professor of Chemistry and Geology. Uh, talk about interdisciplinary work. He was a professor of chemistry and 
geology until a few years later when he became the professor of geology and biology. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> talk about this. Is, this is getting right in there with the biogeochemical uh, <laughs> program that you see springing up now. Uh, I guess there wasn't quite as much uh, information in those <laughs> days. We didn't have uh, didn't have so much to worry about on the web. Uh, and Robinson, uh, this this Robinson professor John Lyle. Uh, turned out to be, although he was listed as a chemist, and if you look him up on the web, he'll be described as a chemist, uh, but all of, almost all of his work was in geology. He, uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, during the Civil War, the school was closed, and uh, at that time, he was uh, working in, in the town. He was a little bit too old at that time to be a soldier, but uh, when the war was over, and Lee came here. Uh, Lee uh, took a real emphasis, a real interest in uh, building the collections again. The collections, uh, the mineral collections that we had earlier had been destroyed when Hunter came in and bombarded uh, Lexington. Uh, they destroyed the collections of, of uh, scientific equipment and collections of minerals and other, they call them curiosities, uh, that they had. <coughs> So uh, they were immediately interested in rebuilding uh, these collections, Lee was. And uh, he, uh, in the catalog, would there would be a page in the catalog in which Lee would be essentially requesting that people send them uh, specimens. And uh, somehow or other, I think this got up to New York State. There were a number of people uh, who were quite anxious after the war to help restore some of the damage that had been done in the South. And one of them was a fellow in Rochester, New York. And he uh, apparently was a good friend of a man named Ward. Anyone associate the name Ward with Rochester? Yeah, yeah that's uh, the, the principal place we buy samples, I suspect, today is from uh, Ward's Natural Science. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Ward, uh, or Dr. Ward, I should say, uh, was in touch with a man from Rochester named Lewis Brook. And uh, Lewis Brook was interested in, in doing something to uh, reconstruct uh, this part of the South. And he, somehow or other, Ward or Brook decided there were two places he wanted to support. One was Washington College, and the other one was the University of Virginia. And so uh, uh, negotiations were set out to uh, bring part of that collection here. The Board of Trustees was anxious to have it. They offered to pay part of the cost of it. And Mr. Ward came down, looked at the site, uh, picked the samples he wanted to put into this collection, and then proceeded to uh, build a, a museum. I might have to go back. Here, here's the museum uh, as it appeared in Robinson Hall. And uh, you can still see some of these samples around the geology department. Uh, there are some of them in a display case in the new science building down on the first level. Uh, here is one, uh, let's see, it was, somebody was telling me they worked, did their thesis here. Uh, Jeff G, right, uh, said he did his thesis on this particular island. And uh, here is a, uh, a plaster cast of it that was part of this collection. I'm going to go back. What happened to the elephant? <laughs> <laughs> well, the museum has a sad history. Uh, as you know, there's no such museum in Robinson Hall today. And uh, it uh, happened in 1936 that uh, the university decided to move the museum out of uh, Robinson Hall because they were building a brand new science building called Howe Hall. And they uh, moved the museum, which had several cabinets. There were 5,000 specimens of herbs in it. Uh, plants of various sorts. This big collection 
uh, thousands of samples of rocks and minerals and uh, other, other curiosities. They uh, moved it into the attic of Powell Hall. And that's where it was when I arrived in 1957. Any of you guys from that era? I've got a couple of people here. You're, did you ever see it, Jay? Did you ever see those cases up in the attic? I don't think I did. No. They were, they were not well taken care of. And uh, <clears throat> needless to say, when Powell Hall was renovated some years later, uh, the, some of those plastic casts got broken up. And my guess is the elephant never made it from Robinson Hall uh, over into Howe Hall. Uh, Campbell met another fellow uh, who had, uh, he was the son of a man who had been president of Washington College uh, named Henry Ruff. And this fellow named William Henry Ruffner uh, turned out to be a geologist and uh, a, a clergyman. And uh, he was uh, eventually appointed as the superintendent of public education for the state of Virginia. So he became a very, very prominent man. He then later went back to being a geologist. And he and uh, Campbell uh, worked together and produced cross-sections uh, here's, here's one of their field parties, <clears throat> just like one of ours. <laughs> Conventional dress, just like that, a boat, a bow tie out there. <laughs> and, and derbies. When did you last go on a field trip where people were wearing derbies? Um, <laughs> well, oddly enough, I can remember when I first got here, there, were, there was a professor at the University of Virginia who dressed like that. Uh, when he went out in the field. Uh, but this is, these are some rough and ready characters studying all the kind of variety of hats, don't they? Well, <laughs> and this, uh, one of the activities that uh, Campbell and Ruffner got involved in was drawing cross sections across the Great Valley here. And uh, this is one that starts over in the Blue Ridge and you can see they show a big unconformity there. Uh, this is the section we, we were looking at up at the nature camp. And then we drove across here. Here's Poplar Hill. Let's see, can I see what, oh, Brushy Hill. Uh, Brushy Hill is in about the same position as Poorhouse Mountain. And this is where the church uh, was found in the limestones. And then you come on out and you're back <clears throat> off to the west. Anybody recognize those features? House Mountain. House Mountain. Yeah, that's House Mountain. And uh, then here's North Mountain. We were standing up here looking back at the back side of House Mountain. And then as, as you went further to the west, uh, the section straightens itself out. And as I, I think uh, Chris pointed out, uh, you don't see these rocks uh, like the uh, Unicoi or Antietam until you get all the way to Wisconsin where the St. Peter uh, comes back up and then you don't see the basement really well until you get into the Rockies. Uh, they didn't take these cross sections that far but they did a whole bunch of them and uh, a, a remarkable job. Well, it's not too much of a surprise looking at the past history uh, that the next geologist who appeared name was Campbell and uh, what do you know he's the son of uh, John Campbell and uh, he had a son named Leslie Lyle Campbell who was the first or one of the very first people to receive a PhD from Washington College and so how many people do you know who have graduate degrees in Washington. <laughs> like, the, the program was not dead when, uh, when I came here in 57. Uh, we still had a, a graduate program in psychology, and I knew the last of the people to get 
that sort of degree. Well, Harry Campbell, uh, the son of John uh, Lyle Campbell, uh, was not only the professor of geology, and he was given the title Robinson Professor of Geology, but he was also the dean of the college for nearly 30 years. So uh, very, very well placed. Uh, <clears throat> And another, another member of this family, John Lyle Campbell, Jr., uh, was uh, treasurer of the university for 36 years. You can see they, they really had a lot on uh, professorships and administrative positions. Uh, <clears throat> Harry ha had an interesting uh, occasion that uh, sort of struck my fancy. They invited a, a well-known evangelist. Uh, who had the name of Billy Sunday? Have you ever heard? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some of you, some of you older folks, have heard of Billy Sunday, and uh, they had Billy Sunday come uh, give a talk at Lee Chapel. And uh, Billy Sunday was introduced by Harry Campbell, who was a very, very austere-looking uh, man. And uh, Billy Sunday walked up after he had been introduced to the front podium and reached up and adjusted the tie on uh, Harry Campbell. It was a little bit out of, stretch, out of uh, straightness. And uh, he, uh, uh, the student body just roared uh, at that, the idea that anyone would touch uh, the dean in that way. <clears throat> well, Harry Campbell was succeeded by a fellow named Marcellus Stowe. Uh, they overlapped for a year or two, and this is a photograph of, of Stowe, went by the name Marr, very, very popular teacher. Uh, he came in in 1927, and uh, he was a very popular teacher, told lots of stories. Uh, I remember I, I was in his class, and he, he conducted the class up on the second floor of Washington Hall, uh, where the president now has his office. That was a two-story auditorium, and he had about 100 students uh, in that class. And uh, he would lecture, and as he lectured, he always took out his Phi Beta Kappa key and sort of twirled it, had it on a, a little uh, chain. He twirled that around, he was very, very proud of that. And uh, he was a very, very well-known and very prominent scientist. He, uh, <clears throat> to give you some idea of the sort of things that he did. Uh, he was uh, nationally known for his work in sedimentation and stratigraphy, Fred. Uh, he did a major study of the James River Basin, big volume. He revived the state geological survey, which had fallen into disrepair. He was, uh, during the Second World War, he became uh, one of the leaders in the War Production Board he was in charge of mineral exploration uh, and, uh, and therefore became very well known uh, within the uh, economic economy. He uh, <clears throat> was still teaching, of course, when, when I came along. And uh, he, uh, I liked him a, a lot. And uh, he liked me enough to invite me to go out uh, to Montana with him. Uh, in uh, the year after I graduated. And uh, we spent uh, three months driving around Wyoming and Montana. Here he is looking for dinosaur bones. Not all dinosaurs were big. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we spent most of our time uh, dealing with people like this who were prospectors. And one thing we learned very quickly was that every prospector thinks that the fortune is just feet ahead in the audit that he's uh, digging in. And these were, folks were no exception. Well, we never found anyone who had found any uranium. He was, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> there was a big reward being offered for the first person who could turn out a railroad car a load of um, uranium. And that came uh, by a fellow named Steen in Moab. Many of you have seen his house. Some of you some of you may have even eaten a meal uh, in a restaurant that's been uh, established there. Well, I had a great uh, year with 
a great summer with Mar out there. And uh, <clears throat> then I went off to graduate school and uh, stayed in graduate school for about four years. And uh, I was just about dis ready to look for a real paying job. And I was trying to, this was one of those times when uh, employment in the oil business was going up. And so there was a, a, a great demand for people with a background in structural geology. And uh, I really pretty much had my choice of which company I wanted to go to work for. And uh, I was sort of weighing that when I got a telephone call from Mark saying, the other fellow in the department, there were two of them, has just resigned and taken a job somewhere else. This was in April, I think. They said, would you be interested in coming down and working uh, here for a year while I look for somebody to fill this job? And so I, I thought about it, <clears throat> went up to the Cosmos Club, had an interview with him, and uh, accepted the job. I had visions of going out and playing tennis and, and uh, living the good fraternity life that I had known <laughs> uh, as an undergraduate. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, when I came back from working in Montana, I discovered that Marr was in the hospital. He'd had a heart attack and he never survived that. So, all of a sudden, after getting out of the van or the car in September, by October, I was the head of the department. <laughs> <laughs> the only person uh, in the department. And uh, some rather extraordinary steps were taken because it was too late to, to mount an international search for a replacement. And uh, so we desperately were looking around, and uh, I think Dr. Gaines said, well, who is the best student in the department? And I said, Uncas McPhinion is. I was hoping Uncas would be here, so he, uh, could. here he is, anyway. Uh, wow. Right. <laughs> punching, punching the wrong one. This is Uncas. punch it again. This is Uncas on the left uh, in, in Montana. Uh, almost immediately I applied for a, an NSF grant and got it. And uh, you can have your guess as to which one of these is me. Uh, I'm in that picture, believe it or not. <clears throat> Along with uh, several of our students, we sort of began a, uh, uh, a program of research in the Madison Mountains. And uh, quite a number of yes, students, yeah. uh, Jay was out there in that part of the world uh, working with uh, another uh, another team. And let's see, who else is here from that era? No, no one. Uh, so uh, uh, we started, uh, started a research program out there. And uh, then we began to look for uh, permanent, more permanent replacements. And uh, uh, the, the, the next person who came along was uh, Sam Kozak over here on the right. Uh, now he was hired because I knew a fellow named Don Eckelman at Brown, who was a friend of mine, and uh, he said there's a real good student uh, at Brown who uh, would be happy to come down and take a, a temporary job with you. And so uh, we brought Sam in the uh, second term, and uh, then after that he went back to graduate school at Iowa, and then uh, several years later the person that we had hired next uh, dropped out of the race. We'll come back to this guy. Uh, which, uh, many of you know. Right. Keep fitting. This was the next. The next person we hired was Odell McGuire. And uh, Odell, one of, one of the fascinating characters of Washington and Lee history, and uh, I, I can't uh, talk too long about him, but um, to give you some idea of how unusual he was, he would get interested in some subject and he would dig into it with a vengeance. Well, sometime late in his career, he got interested in translating the earliest philosophers, manuscripts. Now these are sort of short things. 
But he discovered, well, I can't trust the translations that are coming from the classicists. So I'm going to have to learn how to read Greek myself. So he taught himself Greek. And uh, then he proceeded to unravel these things. He did it. And then he lost complete interest in it. He was never one of these people who was interested in publication. So uh, he just uh, said, I've done it. That's what I wanted to do. I've done it. And it's sitting over there in my office right now, and I'm trying to figure out how I can get this into the hands of somebody who will publish it, because he had insights into the meanings of some of those early manuscripts, many of which dealt with uh, natural phenomena. Uh, there were sections in there about uh, the movement of water in wells and water wells. Well, uh, Odell uh, went on until he retired, and then, I'll see, here he is. Along with Bill. one of our people, Bill. Bill Perry is here. Yeah. Where are you, Bill? Remember that? I do remember that. Here. This is what Odell looked like when he was uh, a young instructor. Uh, he wow. showed up here in a three-piece suit. And after the revolution that took place in the 1970s, he never appeared in a suit again, to my knowledge. He uh, became a real green uh, real greeny, and here he is uh, near the end of his life. Along the way, some of the students uh, thought uh, this group of people uh, was sort of humorous and drew this cartoon, uh, which is uh, labeled the Max Spinsack. Uh, there is Sam, uh, with one of our students over there. <clears throat> and then finally, our, our last addition to the department was, was this guy, uh, who happens to be standing <laughs> Right over there. <laughs> Where is he? There he is. Again, <laughs> changed. This is this is this is taken on a, a field trip that we made out uh, uh, to the west. Fred loved to go to California. We had a had a field trip that that went up and down the west coast, and uh, <clears throat> he turned out, of course, to be one of the funniest people uh, in the department ever. <laughs> he uh, uh, just a persistent publisher. I, uh, I introduced him one night at, at a lecture, and I had a whole string of, of pages which were connected to one another. I dropped it, and so I'm going to read you Fred's publications, and uh, never did have enough time to do that. Uh, but uh, he's a world traveler now. I'm, I'm amazed that he's here. It's a real tribute to you guys. <laughs> it's a real tribute to you guys that he is here. Uh, he wouldn't be, he'd be in China or, or, or Chamonix, uh, some other part of the world. Um, and here we all were together. Uh, this, this group of people constituted the geology department for close to 30 years came to the Washington and Lee Geology Department. That's the group. Yeah, and I think we told it up once, and it was over a hundred years of experience teaching. Over a hundred years? Yeah, yeah. The, the four of us together. Oh, yeah. Easy. Oh, close that, to 150. That's counting, counting each person's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah total them together. Two, my yeah. 30 years is. <laughs> you haven't been here that long. <laughs> well, I arrived in 1957. And uh, Fred, when did you arrive? 67. 1967. Yeah, and I think uh, Sam was six, 61 and Odell was 62 or something like that. Yeah. yeah but Odell right. didn't have a beard until 1971, yeah. right? That, that's right. It was after the... Uh, I don't know, you younger people probably don't uh, recognize or may not remember Kent State and the revolution that occurred about the Vietnam War uh, about that time. But that was when great transformations took place on the campus. That's when conventional dress went out the window. And uh, that's when uh, students really stopped being apathetic and would stop you in the hall and challenge you. It, it was a dramatic time. Uh, I, I can remember uh, we had a faculty meeting one night in Lee Chapel. The whole faculty was there and there was a tremendous uh, discussion about whether or not Washington and Lee should join 
other colleges around the country that were doing away with final exams so that the students could go to Washington to march uh, about uh, the Vietnam War. What do you suppose the decision was in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. <laughs> we didn't do it, but there were some faculty members who shed some tears about that. Uh, very, very controversial. And early on, this is uh, very early, there's Sam as, a, as an infant, uh, there is uh, Odell, oh, I can't stop this thing. There is Odell right there in his suit. Do we have anybody here who's in that picture? I see Jorge Estrada. There's Jorge Estrada, who uh, Randy Weil is a member of the, the board. Uh, here is... Uh, Chip Rodman, who became the Chief Naval Officer for the United States Navy, proving that proving that you can get a, an MD with, with a background in geology. Very, very bright guy. Uh, this fellow back on, on the far side over here is a lawyer for the EPA. Uh, really a very distinguished uh, group of people. We had field trips back in those days. This was before the spring term uh, came about. And uh, we had field trips, and uh, as I'm sure, well, the question has often come up, how many of you all would want to go on a geology field trip scheduled for the spring break? <laughs> oh, okay, well, I say we could still, still put them together. Well, this was one of those, one of those trips uh, that we made down to the beach the Outer Banks, and uh, you recognize Sam in here, uh, but uh, in this photograph also is someone who turned out to be very important for us, and that is a fellow named Frank Young. This is Frank Young as a student. Another one of our field trips without any text. Oh, look at, look at Fred. <laughs> and this is Frank Young as he appeared uh, in the photograph that's mounted in the hall over in the Science Center. Uh, Frank uh, belonged to a family that owned a, an oil business uh, that uh, you've already heard about, I think, once today. And <clears throat> he was uh, trained here in geology. Uh, he did a master, did a, a degree in the Commerce School, and then came back and did a degree in the Law School, and so he really had a very, very great breadth of experience. And uh, working for the oil company, the, the uh, things went in a very good direction for him, and they began to make a, a good bit of money. And uh, I got a letter one day from Frank saying. I don't know what to do with all this money. <laughs> and I would love to think of it. One thing that I would really like to do is to provide some help for the geology department. And so I'm sending you a check, uh, in this case for about $20,000, and uh, they put it, put it to good use. Uh, subsequently, he gave um, even more than that. Here he is, we went out to visit him a couple of times in a cabin that he had at South Fork. I always have uh, fond memories of South Fork. We stopped a field trip out there at South Fork in a motel one night, and uh, in the motel next to us was a group from Colorado School of Mines. And when these folks from Colorado School of Mines discovered we were from a liberal arts college, they really uh, gave the kids a, a hard time. And finally someone piped up and said, well, they may be the ones who are going to do the work, but we're the ones who are going to hire them. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it turned out that way. Uh, but uh, uh, say Frank uh, gave uh, uh, substantially more money later, and people have wondered uh, why he did that. And I had him at home one day. Some people thought I had something to do with this. Uh, hold up in, in uh, Old House Mountain, but um, the department has done done 
great things with the money that Frank has put aside. Thought I'd show a couple of pictures of, of our, one of the things that Frank's money made possible was having a technical assistant in the department. Uh, this is Dennis Slifer, who was here for a number of years. He finally decided he wanted to go into uh, uh, archaeological work. Uh, went up, got a degree in Maryland, moved out to New Mexico, and you can see him uh, talking to one of our field trips about uh, Pentecost. And this is Bob Thrym, sitting right back here, mm -hmm. who uh, many of you will recognize as being uh, the technical assistant in recent years, anyway. <clears throat> well, it, it was about this time. <laughs> I don't look quite like that. Yeah, I, I, told, I told Chris to, to tell me when I should shut up. <laughs> he's, not, he's not indicating this yet. After one of the lectures. Anyway, uh, uh, sometime about this time, it was in the 1970s, uh, we were having trouble recruiting students at Washington and Lee. And uh, uh, a committee was formed uh, to study ways to change this. And uh, I happened to be on that committee. And uh, uh, we were charged, at that time, schools all over the country were doing away with the rather rigid curriculum, which we had, which told you you're going to take two years of English and two years of history and uh, one full year of laboratory science and mathematics or Latin. <coughs> And uh, so this committee was uh, assembled. Well, instead of studying that right off the bat, we got into a discussion of the calendar. Yeah. And this committee had, I was on it, and the other member on it uh, of note was uh, Pat Roberts, who was head of the biology department. And uh, schools everywhere were going to a three-term year, with the winter term being the term that was off. And Pat and I kept thinking it'd be much better to put this in the springtime than in, than in the middle of the winter. And so we won uh, that argument finally and got it through the faculty by a vote of maybe two or three uh, in the majority. Well, there were differences of opinion. And I thought I would show you the opinion expressed by people in the C-School. <laughs> this, is, this is the way they envisioned the, the, the short term uh, in the geology department. I, I won't attempt to identify yeah, anyone here. And we actually here. have someone in that. Oh, are you, oh you're in that picture. <laughs> are you in that picture too? Well, uh, when, when we weren't sleeping on the vans, uh, we would go to quarries. And, and they envisioned that when we were in a quarry, filled with water, great place to swim, uh, and uh, in, in our library, we, people were hard at work in the spring <laughs> And uh, when we weren't in the library working, well, we were out wandering around in the Grand Canyon, and um, well, of course, there was the opinion expressed by the geology department. Uh, which, uh, oh no, this is another one of the sea school uh, views. Uh, here we are. Anybody recognize where that is? Uh, that's uh, right near St. George. It's just north of St. George. Yeah. And here we were feasting out there just as we have been tonight. And having fun in the white sands, studying the formation of sand dunes and rolling down the, the uh, dip slope, like slip wood. slope. But those of us in the geology department knew what was really going on. We were working hard, uh, and we were overcoming all sorts of hardships uh, in the field, looking out for rattlesnakes. Uh, every stop at a McDonald's, uh, someone got out a blackboard and uh, drew a cross section. If we had been there, I, I know exactly what that section would look like. Uh, oh, we have David Garner is in that one. Isn't that David over? His hair was a little bit different then, but at least he still has it. 
<laughs> and we made these trips out uh, to California in 1990. And here we are working hard in the field. Fred is in there somewhere, or he was. I think he's off to the side. I don't know about this fellow up at the top. Uh, oh, here's Jamie Small. <laughs> on one of, one of these, uh, this was after a field trip. <clears throat> I might, might uh, mention that Jamie and some of his classmates are responsible for the dinosaur that flies over the Great Hall. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, the next, the next big change that came along was Washington and Lee went co-ed. And uh, this, <laughs> this was a controversial uh, decision, but um, I think almost all of the faculty agreed that this was the right decision. Uh, the, the place changed. Now, now, mind you, we didn't we didn't go without injuries. We lost we we lost the assimilation committee. You now see people wandering across the grass. <laughs> you don't wear your beanies at football games. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not wearing coats and ties all the time. <laughs> oh, things have changed in big ways. Um, here's another one of our one of my favorite co-ed pictures. I think we have. <laughs> I think someone in this picture is in this room. <laughs> right. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, we took a trip uh, to the Pyrenees uh, a few years ago, 2001. And uh, this was a group that made that trip. You might recognize uh, this lady over here with her first born. That, that, was, that was a remarkable thing to watch because uh, I was sort of under the weather part of the time and I would be down at the bottom of the hill and Elizabeth would be carrying this child on her back up the mountain, <laughs> on into the snow, on and on. It was a, a great, great trip, for me anyway. Uh, <laughs> a lot of fun. And we've got another gift here that um, uh, some of you might not have rem not, might not have noticed Carl Funkhauser. Uh, Carl Funkhauser's name is associated with the cases of minerals, which he collected uh, himself and traded with various museums to get. Uh, and uh, they're on display over on the second floor in How Hall. <clears throat> Something's happened to you, Fred. <laughs> and uh, this fellow back over on the left uh, was President Wilson. And he was there uh, to thank uh, Carl Funkhauser for that collection. And I think it is a splendid collection. And then, what was it, Fred? When, wow. This was 2003. <laughs> I remember that. What is that on your head? <laughs> anyway, we, we started having... Uh, Fred, Fred started the first reunion uh, that we had. And uh, I think this was taken on that, uh, on that occasion. That's the second one. This was the second one. That's his yeah. reunion. Yeah. The, the oh, first okay. one was when you retired. The first Sam one was when I retired. The second one was when Fred retired. And happily, uh, no one is retiring at, at this point. Um, but that was something that came along uh, in the years that passed. And so here we are with a new generation. You've now seen and heard about geologists all the way from Jockey John Robinson. Not a geologist, but he's very responsible for our existence here when a lot of schools don't have a geology department. Uh, a lot of very fine schools, in fact. Um, now, there's this is a new generation plus an onlooker 
uh, up there at the top. And uh, I, I guess uh, I could say that uh, one of the things that I'm so happy about is that I had something to do with the hiring of several of these people in this picture. <laughs> So it remains to be seen what's going to happen before we <laughs> off on a great footing right now. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.